the car is found a stone's throw away from where you work. Does that bother you? No. Doesn't bother you at all. Okay. Her car is found porched a stone's throw away from where you work. That doesn't bother you? No. Does it make you nervous that we may think you did something? No. It shouldn't. This is Lester Jones. Lester was convicted of first-degree sexual assault and the kidnapping of his wife in 1999. At the time of this interview, in 2007, he was the prime suspect in the disappearance of Paige Bergfeld. Um, when did you go Sunday? Um, what did you do Sunday? What? We didn't do anything. We just. What did you tell your wife you did Sunday, Les? What? Um, I have investigators out talking to your wife. Okay. Um, what did you do Sunday evening? I went to bed. Mm, incorrect. Okay. Um, Les, I need to be able to tell this figure when we go look at more on this. Would you know they they need some closure? I would, yes. Okay. They need some closure. Are you saying that I killed her? Is that what you're telling me? Yes. I did not. You have nothing to show that to me. I haven't. I have not seen her. I did not kill her. Go ahead, you can keep talking because I'm waiting to hear how you're going to show that to me. I, I can't show you. I didn't do it. Were you near a car? No. Why'd you leave the house Sunday night? To shut the shop lights off. How long were you there for? Minimal time to come down and go right back. Before assuming that Lester Jones is the wrongdoer in this situation, it may help to know how he ended up here in the first place. Paige Bergfeld was an active member in the community of Grand Junction, Colorado, running several businesses and contributing to multiple clubs. Paige was also a single mother of three, Jess, Taft, and Trigger after her and her husband, Rob Dixon, got a divorce in 2006. On June 28, 2007, babysitter-slash-friend Carol Linderholm and Paige's children were all becoming increasingly worried about their mother's whereabouts. This kind of behavior was extremely out of character for Paige, so that evening, they left multiple voicemails expressing their distress. Hi, Mom, it's me. I just wanted to get home. Love you. Bye. Hey, this is Carol. What's going on? I hope you're all right. Over the next couple of days, Paige remained MIA and more voicemails were sent with no response. Hey, Mom, you are really, really mean. You said you would be that little in charge. Can you help me with my phone? Give me a call on my cell phone. Bye. Hey, Carol, where the heck are you? After making zero contact with Paige from Thursday evening to Saturday morning, a family friend takes Jess to the Mesa County Sheriff's Office to file a missing persons report. That afternoon, Paige was deemed officially missing by the police. Search efforts began immediately. It's just really tough, you know, for, for people to give it themselves to that degree. I just, you know, we're looking for clues to find that person, but there's somebody maybe who's watching this who knows where she is? While the search party continued, investigators also explored the potential that somebody was involved in Paige's disappearance. They started with the most obvious candidates for prime suspects, her two ex-husbands. Paige Bergfeld and Ron Beegler were high school sweethearts. They got married shortly after high school, but the marriage didn't last long. Paige was dead set on becoming a midwife, so she was moving from her hometown in Colorado to attend the University of Florida in Gainesville. However, Ron wouldn't allow this to come between them. He followed her to Gainesville and the couple lived together in an apartment near the campus. This may have been a poor decision as Paige's grades began to suffer. Inevitably, Paige decided to drop out and the couple moved back to Colorado. Paige was a highly optimistic person. Though she strayed from her path to becoming a midwife, she was excited to build a new life with Ron. Naturally, Paige was looking forward to taking the next big step after marriage, starting a family. Unfortunately, this is where the two began to differ. As a family-oriented person, Paige had a strong desire for children and a tightly knit family. In contrast, Ron consistently rejected that notion, fearing the burden of responsibilities. This was a huge deal-breaker for Paige, and the disparity led to a tumultuous relationship. They ultimately divorced in 1997. Ron and Paige had actually stayed in touch over the years, even through her second marriage. And it turns out that he was with her just hours before she disappeared. 
The two met in the middle, having a picnic at a park in Eagle, Colorado. Ron claimed that it was a normal lunch date, and the two parted after only a few hours. Cell phone towers confirmed that they were calling one another as they pulled into their respective cities. The last thing that Paige told Ron is that she was stuck in traffic due to a car accident ahead, which was confirmed by the police. However, this accident occurred five miles past her house. Ron also became worried when she didn't let him know that she had got home safe. Hi, where are you? Call me if you get a chance. I'm getting worried about you. And was actually the first one to make a 911 call to report her missing. Dispatch, this is Clint. Um, yes, I need to talk to you about um, a missing person emergency. Okay. And who is missing? It, it, her name is Paige Dixon. She's How old is Paige? She's um, 33. Oh, okay. And she, and she hasn't been home all, all night Thursday night, all day yesterday and today. Something is definitely, definitely wrong. She either got stuck in or an accident. Moving on to her second marriage, not a year had passed since her divorce with Ron, and Paige had met a new man, Rob Dixon. Rob's parents had made a fortune off of early cell phone technology investments. This allowed Rob to live an extravagant lifestyle. He owned six sports cars, one of which was a bright yellow Ferrari, which was an odd sight to see in a small town like Grand Junction. He was able to shower Paige with expensive gifts, including a $12,000 necklace. When it was time to propose, he presented her with an $85,000 engagement ring. The couple then ran off to none other than Las Vegas to get married. The newlyweds then bought a spacious home back in Grand Junction. It sat on a hill overlooking the breathtaking natural surroundings. Unlike her previous marriage, they started a family immediately. They first had their daughter, Jess, and then their two sons, Taft and Trigger. Paige was living the picture-perfect life that she had always wanted. However, the luxurious lifestyle that Rob had set up for them proved to be unsustainable. These financial stresses led to Rob becoming more and more reactive within their marriage. In October of 2004, Paige called 911. 911, where's your emergency? Um, my husband and I were in a fight. He wanted the children to stay with him. And he said that I would come home and find them all murdered. What's your name, ma'am? This call was made following an intense fight between the two. Police quickly defused the situation and no charges were filed. But a year later, in October of 2005, Paige made another 911 call claiming that Rob had hit her while she was holding one of their sons. He was arrested on misdemeanor charges of child abuse and third degree assault, but ended up pleading guilty to a lesser charge of misdemeanor harassment and was ordered to attend anger management programs. After eight years of a rocky marriage, Paige and Rob finally divorced. Rob declared bankruptcy and moved to Philadelphia, while Paige took custody of the kids and stayed at the multi-million dollar home in Grand Junction. While it would seem that Paige had come out of the marriage on the winning side, Rob's bankruptcy meant that she now had to manage several financial liabilities on her own. Struggling to pay her bills, as well as a $6,000 mortgage, she began running multiple businesses. She provided dance lessons to children, became a top salesman for a kitchen supplies company, and was even involved with Mom's Club a support group for stay-at-home mothers. On top of everything, she still spent plenty of quality time with her children. Her main tool was a notebook containing everything that she needed to keep track of, including upcoming events, soccer and dentist appointments, parent and teacher meetings, and so on. In the face of adversity, Paige took control of her life and was overcoming the financial strain of her previous marriage. However, Rob wanted back in the picture, and in June of 2007, Paige became paranoid about Rob after he had called her saying that he missed the kids and was going to move back to Colorado. Friends say that around this time, just a week before her disappearance, she was certain that something grave was going to happen to her family. Fast forward to the investigation. Police jumped on Rob as the next suspect, especially considering his past charges of domestic violence. But his alibi turned out to be solid, as police confirmed that he was in Philadelphia, about 2,000 miles away the day that Paige vanished. He was even one of the people leaving desperate voicemails to her. Paige, if you get this, please, please call somebody. Please come home. Please tell us that you're all right. Everybody's worried about you. Everybody's looking for you. Please, Paige, let us know that you're okay. Please, please, please call someone. They put Rob on the back burner for now, but he wasn't off their radar completely, as they knew about Paige's paranoia surrounding him during the week before she disappeared. If Rob was somehow involved, his motive would have been clear to regain custody of his children. It wasn't until Sunday night, July 1st, that a huge breakthrough was made. 911, this is Jesse. Where's your emergency? 
Hi, I'm at the corner of 23 and Logos, and there is a car on fire in the parking lot um, at the building right here. There's a car on fire? Yeah. Do you see flames or smoke? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of flames. A 911 call was placed reporting a red Ford Focus burning in a parking lot. It was Paige's vehicle, only two miles away from her home. Firefighters arrived on the scene and extinguished the flaming car. Investigators were able to salvage only a few clues from the wreck. First, considering Paige's height, the driver's seat of the vehicle seemed to be pulled back further than expected. They confirmed this by having a woman the same height as Paige get into the driver's seat. This suggested that someone taller than her was the last person to operate the vehicle. Second, Paige's notebook was miraculously found unscathed. It seemed as if the melted dashboard had fallen over it, protecting it from the surrounding flames. Taking a look inside, the day planner was filled with her mundane yet chaotic schedule. But upon further inspection, they noticed the dates surrounding her disappearance. The 26th to the 29th had been ripped out. It was becoming clear that this was more than just a missing persons case. We were... Hopeful when we found the car, things would uh, fall into place, and maybe they will. This isn't a situation where Paige left on her own volition. You know, it occurred to me, I hadn't cried in a long time. I've learned how to do that. These discoveries only fueled the efforts to find Paige, and an even bigger search ensued. Just seeing the dad on TV and everything like that, and I have, you know, some children of my own, and I know what I'd be feeling like if one of my children was gone, and I just wanted to try to help if I could. Just south of Grand Junction, along Highway 50, more clues were being found. Volunteers discovered more than 100 items that belonged to Paige laid out over a 15-mile stretch. Some of the items found included her children's medical cards, her wallet, blank checks for her business account, and many more items that she was unlikely to discard without a good reason. Detectives had two theories. The first, someone had abducted Paige and scattered her belongings to misdirect the investigation. The second, Paige herself had managed to throw her belongings out of the vehicle to leave a trail. However, this trail of evidence ultimately ended in a river bank, which they continued to search with no result. Among the trail of evidence, there was an advertisement for a company called Models Inc. This specific item began to ring bells when investigators took a closer look at Paige's phone records it became apparent that among her several upstanding businesses, she was also operating a more provocative one. Hello, you've reached Models Inc., Colorado's premier gentleman service. Colorado's premier gentleman service. Advertising through sites such as Craigslist and NaughtyNightlife.com, Paige had been living a double life as an escort, offering massages and other services under the nickname of Carrie. Upon learning this information, they had also discovered that Paige's nighttime endeavors played a big factor in her failed marriages. While she was with Ron Beegler, she started working part-time at a strip club against his wishes. This played a role in their decision to get a divorce. That same strip club is where she met High Roller Rob Dixon. Following her marriages, it seemed that she had reverted back to this lucrative line of work in order to stabilize her financial situation. Her friend, Carol Linderholm, the friend babysitting her kids when she disappeared, was the only person who knew about this business of hers. It turns out several potential clients had contacted her the night of her disappearance, looking to meet up with Carrie. Yeah, this Motel 6, room 237. I was just checking to see if you had somebody coming out or not. Thank you. Yes, this is Buddy. I was wondering if you had any girls available this afternoon. Hello, my name is Bill. Just calling to see if anybody's still available for the night. Hello, yeah, this is Jim. Just calling to see if uh, Carrie was available tonight. I'm going to go get me a motel room now. This man, by the name of Jim, had called five times the day of her disappearance. Each call made from a prepaid track phone device. The final call was made from Paige to Jim's track phone, implying that she had gotten back to him. Detectives were able to track down this device and determined that it was purchased on June 26th at a local Walmart. They promptly recovered the surveillance footage. By corroborating the time of the purchase using the store's purchase records, they confirmed that this was their guy. This is Jim. If you've been paying attention... This man may seem familiar. He was later identified as Lester Jones, the person being interrogated at the beginning of this video. He stands at six foot five, someone who might push a driver's seat far back to drive a vehicle. I didn't touch her. I haven't seen her. Les, don't even say that to me anymore. I don't even want to hear. You didn't touch her. You know, I have not seen her. You know where she now. Les, I said I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. You know where she's located.
I think you know where it can be found. Um, just to let you know, um, your vehicle is, being, is going to be seized and I'll be getting a warrant for it. Okay. Um, and we will probably be seizing some other things and, and executing some other warrants, just so you know. Okay. All right. Do you have the keys for your truck or would you just prefer that we do it without um, I have the keys for it? It's just easier for tow guys to get it to move from one place to another with key. Okay. Um, would you like the ride back to your business? Okay. Mike, would you mind getting on the ride? Lester's white Dodge pickup holds significance in Paige's case. Carol had told investigators a story where Paige was scheduled to meet with a familiar client in a white pickup truck after work one evening. Before she got the chance to leave her workplace, the white truck pulled into her office parking lot. It was possible the driver had spotted Paige. The truck turned around and then drove away. But she was terrified that this client had found out her true identity. This client didn't let up and even requested her again the night before her disappearance. Carrie was unavailable, but her friend Carol agreed to fill in for her and scope out the sketchy client. During the appointment, he seemed more focused on asking questions about Carrie than the massage itself. Carol claimed that this client was in fact Lester Jones. After looking at surveillance footage of her work, it turned out that the white vehicle circling the parking lot was not a truck at all, but a Chevy Impala. However, Lester's wife, who was out of town at the time, owned a white Chevy Impala. Following Lester's first interview, police inspected Lester's workplace and discovered heaps of intriguing evidence. They found handwritten notes about their other escorts, detailing their bra sizes and what services they had offered. It seemed that Lester came prepared, hosting a stash of Viagra in his tool box drawer and multiple wigs. They also found packaging for a track phone, a Victoria's Secret bra matching Paige's cup size, and a weight scale from her kitchen sales company, The Pampered Chef. Lester's boss even told investigators that a gas canister was out of place on Monday morning. It sat only 500 meters away from Paige's burning Ford Focus. Now you may think, well, maybe he used the gas can. It's RV repair. Maybe they had a gas can. No. Police questioned the owner's and co-workers, and there was no reason for him to have a gas can at his workspace. Do you have a gas can at your workspace? Because I don't. Not only that, but when police dogs tracked Lester's scent, it led them to the driver's seat of the vehicle, strengthening their case even further. The detectives then brought Lester back in for another interrogation, in which he continued to deny his involvement despite the mountain of evidence piled against him. I never met Paige. I know for a fact you were meeting models and corporate agents had called and set an appointment with that track phone. No, sir. Yes. Explain to me why the track phone is in your trash at your workspace. I have no clue why it's in there. How did that get there? I don't know. How did your picture get on a video at the very same time the track phone is being ordered? I can't tell you that. I was in Walmart and I bought a monster cable. You bought monster cable. Even though the receipt comes back to a check point. I did not Even buy Even though a the clerk remembers you at the back phone. I did not buy a track phone. So video's lying, clerk's lying, receipt's lying. Did you guys go for a ride? Did you go up Highway 50? No. Did she put all this stuff out? How did no, stuff get up on Highway 50? I did. I didn't. I haven't been anywhere with this lady. In this interrogation, Lester ended up admitting to knowing who Rob was, and investigators thought that they had struck gold. It would make sense for the two men to be working together. Rob had the motive, regaining custody of his children. Lester had the means, scheduling an appointment with Paige through her secretive business that very few people knew about. However, after excessive digging, they were unable to find anything that linked Rob to Lester leading up to Paige's disappearance. As far as the detectives were concerned, there was no way to build a solid case against Rob, so they focused solely on Lester as the prime suspect. Two days following this interview, they called him to let him know that his vehicles, which were both impounded from a search warrant, were now available for pickup. Hello? Yes, may I speak with Ralph, please? Hold on, please. Hello, this is Art Smith with the Sheriff's Office. Just calling to let you know that we have both your cars ready. Are you with Elaine right now? I'm sorry? I don't think so. Mr. Jones, I'm not following you. You asked me where I would bury a body. I'm sorry? You asked me where I should bury a body. 
Apparently, right before this phone call, Lester had become delirious after taking a high dose of sleeping medication. Tensions built to a high between law enforcement and Lester Jones, but they were missing one key piece of evidence that would justify his arrest, Paige Bergfeld's remains. While there have been plenty of cases in which a suspect is arrested before a body is found, Paige had lived a double life, lying to everybody around her. The defense could have easily proved reasonable doubt by suggesting that she ran away from her complicated life in Grant Junction, hoping to never be seen again. This could have led to a losing battle if prosecutors took Lester to court. The disappearance of Paige Bergfeld remained a mystery for nearly five years. Then, on October 6, 2012, hikers discovered human remains in a dried-up creek bed near Wells Gulch Spring, just a few miles from where the evidence trail was left on Highway 50. Dental records confirmed it was Paige Bergfeld. It was likely that her killer buried her five years prior, and over the seasons, heavy spring runoff had uncovered what was left. Her remains found yesterday in Delta County by a hiker off Highway 50, one mile up Wells Gulch Road. Investigators called this man, Lester Ralph Jones, a suspect then and still do today. There are reports he was a client of her escort service, but he was never charged. How can one human being treat another human being so badly? I mean, what a, what a bad person. What an evil person. Finally, the case went from a missing person's case to a homicide, giving investigators the means to take Lester into custody. So I'm pleased today to stand before you and announce that we have arrested Lester Jones in the uh, kidnapping and murder of Paige Bergfeld. Because this went cold for five years, the process to build a case took two more. This trial began another two years later in September of 2016. Things were getting heated before the trial even started. Ron Beagler had a death wish for Lester and shared a little too much. The defense caught wind of a threatening comment Ron made about Lester. This concerned them and it had to be addressed with the judge before they could proceed. And indicated that he wanted Mr. Jones to be found not guilty so that he could kill him and feed him his genitals. Although he used a different word than that. If you have any outbursts or you do anything in an attempt to harm anybody in the courtroom, that that will result in serious consequences. Is okay? Over exaggerated. All right. Sorry, counsel, maybe taken out of context. The prosecution presented a narrative to the jury. Lester Jones was obsessed with Paige Bergfeld, but the feelings were not reciprocated, and Paige tried to avoid him as a client moving forward. Lester would not stand for this, and so he bought a track phone and hid his identity under the guise of Jim to lure Paige back to him. From there, he likely subdued her, and using her vehicle, he drove her near Wells Gulch, where he claimed her life and buried her. Along the way, Paige was able to leave a breadcrumb trail by throwing her belongings out of the vehicle. To strengthen this narrative, in addition to all of the evidence that we have mentioned thus far, a new face was brought to the stand, Lester's ex-wife, Lisa Nance. She outlined their history. After a brief honeymoon stage, Lester began to show alarming behaviors. He constantly monitored Lisa's every move. He even tapped her phone calls and planted secret recording devices to listen in on her conversations with friends. Lisa decided to end the relationship before the situation could escalate. But things only escalated from there. While Lisa was driving her new boyfriend to work in the morning, Lester drove up beside their car and veered them into a ditch. He then put his vehicle in reverse and rammed their car again, causing the airbags to deploy. Lisa's boyfriend took off running, but Lester shot at him with a handgun. The bullets just grazed his head. Lester ended up running away, but cops tracked him down and arrested him. A few weeks later, Lester had been released and invaded her home while she was alone. However, he wasn't aggressive. She found him eerily sitting on her couch, quieter than usual. Putting her de-escalation skills to use again, she suggested that they go out to dinner, to which he agreed. However, once behind the wheel, Lester drove them out of town toward the mountains. Once far enough into the drive, Lester said, I'm going to kill you, and started slapping Lisa. Lisa convinced him to talk it out, and he said, in order to prove her love, she had to make love to him. She convinced him again, this time to rent a motel room. After bringing them to one, he went inside to check in. That's when she got behind the wheel and sped off. She proceeded to report him to the police. A few days later, he was arrested once again. Lester was convicted of assault and kidnapping and served three years in prison. In theory, showcasing this pattern of dangerous behavior was an effective tactic. 
However, the prosecution's case had flaws. The defense claimed that the investigation was handled poorly, focusing on a hunch that they had on Lester from the beginning instead of putting more effort into other potential suspects. So, the defense brought those potential suspects into the courtroom to do the questioning themselves. They also brought experts to the stand, saying that about a month had gone by before the dogs tracked Lester's scent around the evidence and there was no way a scent could be tracked accurately that far into an investigation. If this was true, the prosecution's narrative would be in shambles. The only thing directly proving Lester was near any of Page's belongings were the dogs tracking his scent to it. Nearly all of their forensic evidence would be discredited. It was time for jury deliberations, and after three days, they were deadlocked, unable to reach a unanimous decision. The judge had no choice but to declare a mistrial, and a retrial was booked for a few months later with a new jury. A man accused of kidnapping and killing a Grand Junction mom who also ran an escort service, well, he is set to go back on trial. Jury selection is now underway in the case of Lester Jones, who's accused in the death of Paige Bergfeld. The only significant difference in the second trial was the prosecution's closing statement. They took the time to go through each of the defense's alternative suspects and explained why it was unlikely any of them were the culprit. Once again, the jury deliberated for three days, but this time they had reached a unanimous verdict. Jury verdict, count number one, charge of murder in the first degree felony murder. We, the jury, find the defendant Lester Ralph Jones guilty of count one, murder in the first degree felony murder. That is signed by our four-person Jury verdict count number two, charge of murder in the second degree. We, the jury, find the defendant, Lester Ralph Jones, guilty of count two, murder in the second degree. That is signed by our foreperson. Jury verdict count number three, charge of second degree kidnapping. We, the jury, find the defendant, Lester Ralph Jones, guilty of count three, charge of second degree kidnapping. And that is signed by the foreperson. Lester Jones was convicted for kidnapping and the first-degree murder of Paige Bergfeld. He was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. He remains in prison and continues to claim his conviction was unlawful, as he believes there was no physical evidence tying him to the crime.